health that we're going to forego creating in order to have zero discernible effect on the environment. A practical Earth Day. That's our show tonight. And now, John Stossel. Tuesday's Earth Day. This is a holiday that brings out stupidity in people. We will hear all kinds of bizarre things this week, some on this program. The premise is noble. We all want to protect the environment. But there's this religious-like satisfaction some people get by thinking that they can save the planet from man's extravagance. You get a taste of that of the new movie Noah's Ark. My father said that one day, if man continued in his way, he's... The Creator would annihilate this world. I misspoke. It's just called Noah. It's about Noah's Ark. But that's the kind of stuff that's been happening, I hear. Environmental annihilation is coming because we've been evil. We pollute, we frack, we burn oil, cut down trees, overconsume. But cheer up, we can still save ourselves. We face a fork in the road. Few futures stand before us. We can continue on our current path, where we rely on outdated electricity grids, inefficient buildings, and dirty power plants that contaminate our air. Or, we can change. We can create greener cities where solar panels and wind turbines power our homes. Here's the thing. This cleaner, more sustainable future is within our grasp. It's within our grasp. Greener cities with solar panels and wind power. Our president has a plan, too. He says... We can break our dependence on oil with biofuels and become the first country to have a million electric vehicles on the road by 2015. Whoopee, and they all applaud, but oops, by 2015, that's next year, and America doesn't even have a tenth that many electric vehicles. To put it in perspective, this is what we've got versus the president's prediction. And even if, he, if we reached his goal, it wouldn't have had any real effect on climate change. Most Americans, including our politicians, aren't very good with numbers. They're even worse with science. So let's turn to two specialists, one who's right and one who's wrong. No, I'm not being fair, but now you know where I stand. Uh, James Taylor studies environmental policy at the Heartland Institute. Paul Gallet is president of the environmental group Riverkeeper. So, Paul, how am, how am I getting it wrong? All you want to do is deny the problem. That's not very American, John. You need to solve problems in America. We're here to solve problems, not to deny them. And the problem is climate change. The problem is giving our kids and their kids a planet will be happy to give them and that they'll be happy to live on giving them a better standard of life than our parents gave us. These are old-fashioned values and you as a conservative should be embracing them, not ridiculing them. Well, uh, just for clarity, I don't call myself a conservative. I call myself a libertarian. Big difference. I, I don't want to police the I'm bedroom. I'm sure there is. I'm sure there is. I'm learning that now. But I... I Bro, don't you want to preserve the planet for your children? Absolutely, we all do. But our current path, as we saw in the clip, what is the current path? It's a sound path. According to EPA, we've reduced air emissions 70% since 1980, and the trend keeps going down. So we're doing a great job. Yeah, let, let's be clear on that. When people hear this crisis about uh, greenhouse gases, they think the air is getting dirtier. But you both agree that... As far as the bad stuff we inhale, the particulates, sulfur dioxide, nitrogen dioxide, that stuff has gone down. Clean water and clean air and water laws too. work. We have to keep making them work because the Clean Water Act, we were supposed to be done. All the rivers were supposed to be fishable and swimmable. Anybody out there in your nation fish or swim or boat? I think so. Only half the rivers that we were supposed to clean up have been cleaned up. Let's finish the job. And Riverkeeper has helped make that happen and cooperating with government, passing laws. But they are getting cleaner, right? There's been delay in some of the treatment. But it's, it's moving in the cleaner direction. I can fish and swim in the rivers right next to New York City. You can sometimes, but when it rains, you end up with so much pollution that you can't do that. So we've been cutting that pollution slowly but surely. But you know what happened since the 80s, since the libertarian movement really took wing? We, stopped, things, we stopped spending on infrastructure. That's not the values that I grew up with when I looked at my dad 
and he was a Republican committeeman, and he said, you invest in your community. He talked about the greatest generation. We don't talk about the greatest generation anymore James, because we don't emulate them. We're not investing in our community. Well, Paul talks about spending. I talk about results. If we see our environment getting cleaner, then why are we saying we're not spending enough? Why are we measuring progress by how much money and power we're giving the government? I want to see results, and I'm seeing results. EPA is seeing results. That's even more important. You know, the government of the state of New York has just worked with the city of Albany to cooperatively get them to spend $140 million that'll take their water quality in the Hudson from the worst to first. Let's finish the job. It's a proven set of laws. Let's not ridicule the, the, worst? the progress. I can drink this practically unfiltered. Oh, I'm going to send you right up to Albany after a rainstorm and watch you drink it, John. That, that will not be fun for either of us, but uh, maybe your viewers will get a kick out of it. Riverkeeper's website says there's only one sustainable option smart energy, and that's wind, solar power, biomass, biofuels, geothermal, hydropower. What's wrong with this argument? Well, as, as I already mentioned, we see that pollution is already declining. Why do we need to have, say, wind power, wind turbines, which require 600 square miles of land development to replace a single conventional power plant? Especially when the costs are so much higher, this takes money away from other key environmental issues, as well as health issues, as well as housing, etc. What's wrong with solar power? Solar power, the same thing. It's very land intensive. It's also very water intensive. Solar thermal power, which is the least expensive form of solar, that requires two to four times more water than conventional energy. And where are we producing solar power? In the deserts, where we need this water. You know, the biggest growth in solar energy is on rooftops. It's what they call a disruptive uh, development in which the old style of generating power and then sending it through transmission lines in people's communities is less and less important. You had 30% of the power created in 2013 was solar. Same thing with wind. And I put them on my roof. I have them in my rooftop. Bless you for that. It's great. You it heats, are a good heats guy. the water. But I only put them there because the idiot state of Massachusetts throws money at me to subsidize my putting them there. Poor people who can't afford to buy a house for every have dollar to pay for it. of subsidy of the wind and solar and energy efficiency, there's thirteen dollars of subsidy for fossil fuel. You know, you can buy a big old James, SUV. I gotta let you answer. You can buy that a big old SUV and you can get a huge tax credit relative to the tax deduction you get for a little old hybrid. According to the Congressional Budget Office, when we're talking kilowatt hour for kilowatt hour subsidies, wind power, solar power receive 10 times as many subsidies as natural gas, 50 times as many subsidies as coal power. When he talks about these extra subsidies, it's merely because conventional energy is more efficient, more effective, and it has far greater market share than wind and solar. He wants to talk about aggregate, but he doesn't want to talk about per kilowatt hour. I want you, about, you want more subsidies for oil and coal? Kill them all, John. Kill them all. All subsidies. Absolutely. Well, you know, that's an interesting one. That one we can agree on. Listen, I want a transition. I want a transition that is smart, sensible, and gets us where we need to go. I'll be perfectly honest with you. I want a price on carbon, but I want one that's done in a revenue-neutral fashion. And I want to know why Republicans, I realize I'm with the Libertarians now, Republicans have walked back from their own baby. Cap and trade was their baby. In 1990, the first Bush administration came up with that, and that's one of the reasons why the air is cleaner. Carbon tax would be better, but Paul, it appears that as far as the public's concerned, your side has won the debate because when I interviewed people on the street, most everyone said they were worried about global warming and they talked about wind power and solar power. Solar power, definitely. Solar. It's cleaner. We're a big fan of wind in the UK uh, and we have a lot of wind. James, you've lost. <laughs> I think people are concerned because they hear so much in the media, but when you prioritize, when you ask people, what are you most concerned about? What do you want politicians to deal with? Well, global warming comes in dead last. So I think in that case, we have some hope, John. We're not going to sentence ourselves to economic deprivation based upon these false global warming You're not warming worried fears. about global warming? Not at all. Not at all. What we see right now, Temperatures that rose during the 20th century, just a little bit, about one degree. Can't even tell the difference. It's 43 degrees outside right now in late April in New York City. Yeah, well, that you means can't nothing. Tell the that's difference. New York City. But, but what we're looking at is a very small amount of warming that's been beneficial. And when we look at the past six, seven, eight thousand years, far better context, we're still much cooler than the long-term average. Whenever we hear this uh, mantra about what's well, the hottest decade on record, what they dis what they define on record is is merely the past hundred or, hundred or so years since the Little Ice Age ended. In a long-term context in a more appropriate context we're actually quite cool so well, here's James, what here's what your president says about skepticism like yours that dismiss the 
promise of renewable energy. Some of these folks uh, want to dismiss the promise of solar power and wind power and fuel efficient cars. In fact, they make jokes about it. If these guys were around when Columbus set sail, they'd be charter members of the Flat Earth Society. I, I got to respond to something James said before. The idea that global warming, climate change is good for you. Let's go down to the Jersey Shore. Let's go out to the Rockaways and tell folks who lost their homes in Hurricane Sandy, which James believes would have been worse if not for Let's compare the number change. of hurricanes now versus 30, 40, 50 say, years James. ago. No, it's not what I have to say. It's absolute objective facts. The number of hurricanes, we never the severity hurricane of hurricanes like is hurricane declining. Sandy before. You want it's people to believe there's steroids. never been a hurricane before. We've seen many more hurricanes like Hurricane Sandy. Hurricane Sandy was category two at its strongest. When you look at category three, four, and five hurricanes, they used to strike the New York City area on a fairly regular basis. If you go back to the early 20th century, we saw major categories coming up the East Coast frequently. You don't see that anymore. You know, it used to be these guys at Heartland said it's a hoax. Now they say we don't have to worry about it, and now they say it's good for you. I really wish they'd pick a story and stick with it. Just to be clear, you're saying in some cases it's good because more carbon dioxide means good for plant growth. We look at crops, we see crop increases, we see crop production increasing, we see a declining number and severity of tornadoes, we see a declining number and severity of hurricanes. Right. But there is bad anyway, stuff you too, and there are thrive in warmer temperatures. And when he says Heartland, that's Heartland Institute where you work, there is bad stuff that might happen. Serious scientists are worried. Might happen if we have the type of warming that is not going to happen for many centuries, because we've been there before. We were there a thousand years ago during the medieval warm period, we were there 2,000 years ago during the Roman warm period, and whenever temperatures How has been warm, his side won the debate better because his side uses faith-based science they published a paper <laughs> a couple of weeks ago if you look at the citations in their executive summary there's 20 citations 11 of them are 30 years old or more Six more of them were created by the people who wrote the paper. Most of now them we're getting paid. into wonky territory yeah, but that's here. Okay, I'm happy Let to get me tell the you the difference between faith-based faith-based science and true science. He is faith-based because he looks at these computer projections, these models that are programmed. Yeah, that's horribly. serious science. I'm quoting real-world facts, real-world data from today, stuff that we're able to measure and prove. He says, "Well, but we program these computer models to say this. That is faith-based science." You pay your scientists, we don't pay ours. Our <laughs> science is peer-reviewed. You work for free. Listen, on that I'm note, thank, thank you both, Paul Gallet and James Taylor. You're not the singer. But I can sing. But don't. Well, keep keep the conversation the going on Facebook or Twitter. Use that hashtag there, Earth Day. Let people know what you think.